from today's lecture onwards, we'll be covering other family, bacterial families in gamma proteobacteria. Those bacteria under this class, most of them can be cultured, okay? So, Vibrio cholera is aquatic, okay? Aquatic bacteria. So, it is a very common organism in the surface waters of the world. Vibrio cholera is mostly fresh water and brackish water. So, brackish water is water in between sea water and fresh water. Community, the saltiness of it is in between. So, river cholera, mostly fresh water and brackish water. Okay. So the, but the other vibrios, most of them are marine, marine water, okay, sea water. It is slightly curved, there is a coma shape with a single polar flagellum. So, research into vibrio cholera. Uh, found that Vibrio cholera can exist as a viable but non culturable BBNC state. It's alive, but you cannot culture it. That's why sometimes, even when you test the waters, you don't find any Vibrio cholera. Doesn't mean it's not there. It's, it might be there. And so, in order to screen for it, you may have to do PCR. Okay? Because they can be viable but not culturable. We view cholera, we are mostly interested in the, the stereotype that causes the epidemic cholera. So, for we view cholera causing epidemics, they are of the zero bar O1. Most of the time you have Vibrio cholera non O1. It's very important that you show that it is non O1. Because if it's O1, stereotype O1 it is dangerous. Okay? It is potentially dangerous. Then under the O1 stereotype, you have your Ogawa, Inaba, and Hikujima. Ogawa has a, B, Naba has A, C, and Nikojima has A, B. So from here you can see you, need, you only need to test B and C. Then under O1, they found a bio wow, uh, related to O1, but it's somehow uh, less, vir less virulent, less lethal. They name it the bio wow L tor. It's still very rare, okay? Most of the time you will get the the classical O1. So humans are the only source of infection. The transmission is through foods and drinking water. The infective dose is more than 10 power of 8. Okay, so that's a lot, right? That's about 100 million, 100 million cells. So usually these kind of situations exist after when you have floods, when you have earthquakes, catastrophe when you don't have clean drinking supply, clean water, you don't have clean water. So when you don't have clean water, and when there's a flooding and uh, earthquakes and all that, essentially sewage systems also break down. So the chances of cross-contamination with water supply is increased. Okay, That's why you will get this uh, cholera epidemic. And also, when these things happen, health services take time to reach you. That's why the mortality rate is increased. Although it's non-invasive, it produces a toxin, cholera toxin, that causes massive watery diarrhea. So up to 20 liters in a day. The diarrhea is up to, you will be purging 20 liters per day. That's a lot, okay? So if you do not replenish water, your liquids, your blood become too viscous, too thick. So this is, this one is called exicosis. Exicosis is the state where your blood becomes too thick, leads to organ failure. Your blood, heart cannot pump it, 
your kidneys cannot work, uh, process it. Okay, blood becomes too thick. Cholera toxin is very interesting because the structure is all, nearly the same as the heat stable uh, toxin of uh, E. coli. Okay, where you have the the five B subunits that bind to the epithelial cells and a subunit A1 that causes, that triggers the adenylate cyclase to produce cyclic AMP. So the cholera toxin will activate the adenylate cyclase to produce cyclic AMP. The production of cyclic AMP will cause the cells to lose electrolytes. And when you lose your electrolytes, the water will uh, follow for because to balance the osmotic pressure. That's why you have a lot of uh, liquid loss. Usually, the activation of a adenylate cyclase will, will also follow inactivation, which is when the enzyme activates adenylate cyclase, after a while, it will stop the activity action. However, the cholera toxin prevents the inactivation. So the adenylate cyclase remains active. Okay, so you are no longer able to control the action of adenylate cyclase. That's why it remains consistently active. So you ha have persistent loss of fluids because of the large amount, voluminous amount of liquid loss. You have very uh, specific rice water stools. So I've, I've mentioned rice water stools, which means the stool sample is essentially liquid with a few specks. Okay. Uh, the specks are mostly from uh, your mucus and epithelial cell. So lethality is up to 50% in untreated cases because you lose too much water. So you need antibiotics to reduce the number of bacteria and a lot of electrolyte replacement therapy. Bibliopara-hemolyticus is important in the food industry, especially the seafood industry. So Malaysia exports a lot of uh, seafood we have active aquaculture, so aquaculture that produces shrimps, also fish, okay? So for all this seafood that you need to export, it has to be processed, be, you have to sample it and you have to check for Vibrio Parahemolyticus. The criteria is actually present or absence, so you don't, they don't really need to know how much. If it's present, you cannot export into their country. They will not accept it. So Vibrio Parahemolyticus produces uh, causes gastroenteritis, so abdominal pain, vomiting, and but it is self-limiting. You have recovery after a few days. First step of enrichment is usually alkaline peptone water for both Vibrio Cholera and Vibrio Parahemolyticus. But for Vibrio para Parahemolyticus, you have to plus. You have to plus sodium chloride because Vibrio parahemolyticus is uh, a marine bacteria, so they require sodium chloride. So only after enrichment, TCBS is adequate. Okay, thiosulfate titrate salt sucrose agar. So this agar contains sucrose. Sucrose will differentiate cholera from parahemolyticus. Parahemolyticus is the negative for sucrose fermentation, but cholera is positive. So on TCBS, Vibrio cholera will be yellowish, Vibrio parahemolyticus will be greenish. So it allows TCBS allows you to differentiate those Vibrio that can ferment sucrose and those that cannot. And TCBS is a very good media for Vibrio because almost all Vibrios can grow on TCBS. Okay, so it's a very good media. So you have 
if it's once you detect Vibrio cholera, you have to test for the O1 antiserum and then test whether they are Ogawa Inaba or Ikojima. Then for Parahemolyticus, just take note that most of the tests require supplementation of salts. You need to add either 2 to 3% of sodium chloride. Okay? This one you need to do. If not, the bacteria will not grow well. Then your biochemical test, the reactions will not be accurate. Clinical specimen includes rectal swabs. Rectal swabs usually when they screen for food handlers, people working in the food industry. They will need to screen whether they have vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera. Vibrio onificus is an emerging pathogen in aquatic systems. Most of the time it causes gastroenteritis. However, in, for people with compromised immune system, you have septicemia, can become a blood infection, and the mortality rate is very high, 50%. All these vibrios that I mentioned are also found in Malaysian waters. Okay, including vibrio monificus. So, if you have deep cuts on your hand, um, on your body, you are advised not to go swimming. Okay, because infection can occur. So, when infection occurs, because the vibrio monificus is dangerous, the doctor will ask your permission to amputate the limb. Uh, this is called aggressive debridement. So they would recommend that they remove more of your tissue, if not possibly the lid. Because this is to prevent the bacteria from causing death. So in America, it is uh, uh, patients with chronic illnesses I actually advise to avoid uh, raw or inadequately cooked seafood because they are afraid of uh, getting infection from Vibrio onificus. So this is a, an emerging uh, Vibrio infection. Next we'll look at Aromonas in the order Aromonadales, family Aromonadaceae. It uh, exhibits a fermentative reaction in the OF test, oxidase positive, and is motile. The type species is Aeromonas hydrophila. It is a gram negative bacilli, non spore forming, oxidase positive, and fermentative. It has a polar flagella. It lives in aquatic environments similar to Vibrio, both fresh and salt water clean and polluted waters. Aromonas hydrophila cause, can cause diseases in aquatic animals and humans. In animals, causes ulcers, tail rot, fin rot, and hemorrhagic septicemia in fish, and red leg or internal hemorrhaging in frogs. So this is important to the Agriculture industry, also in the frog farming industry. Whereas in humans, consumption of uh, food contaminated with large numbers of this bacteria cause and gastroenteritis that is similar to either cholera, where we have rice water diarrhea, or dysentery, where we the stool has blood and mucus. So the the dysentery type diarrhea is more serious and can last a few weeks but if you have an open wound and you are exposed to the bacteria in water the, the bacteria may infect and cause cellulitis or skin inflammation as the bacteria is highly resistant to antibiotics the combination is, of antibiotics is usually used for treatment in humans whereas in aquaculture and fish hatchery Teromycin is used to prevent uh, infection by Aeromonas hydrophila. And next we'll look at the order Pasteurellales, family Pasteurellaceae. 
especially Pestorella and Haemophilus. So these are fermentative in the OF test. Oxidase positive reaction and is non motile. For Haemophilus, the most important is Haemophilus influenzae. They are non motile gram negative fraud and often encapsulated. They can be subclassified into serovars A to F, where serovar B causes most Haemophilus infections in humans. However, vaccines for zero B is available. Haemophilus influenza is a parasite of the respiratory tract mucosa and occurs in 30 to 50% of healthy humans as non encapsulated and avirulent. The pathogenic type will have a capsule that protects them from phagocytosis and is a primary determinant of pathogenicity. Uh, Haemophilus influenzae causes upper and lower respiratory tract infection in children and individuals with weakened immune defenses. Treatment is via antibiotics. However, beta lactamase producing strains are now beginning to be discovered. Satellite phenomenon is something that is used as a test for Haemophilus influenza where the Haemophilus influenza culture is strict on blood agar and then a Staph aureus culture is overlaid as a line onto the blood agar. After Incubation, you will see colonies, small colonies of Haemophilus influenza growing only when it's near to the Phylococcus aureus. This is because Haemophilus influenza requires growth factors that are not available until Staph aureus lies the blood agar blood cells and release these factors for the use by Haemophilus influenza. Other Haemophilus includes Haemophilus ducreyi that causes a tropical venereal disease. There is painful bleeding and ulcer mainly in the genital area. Also, Haemophilus aegyptus that causes purulent conjunctivitis, mainly in northern Africa. Next, we have Pestorella, also in the order Pestorella list, family Pestorella CA. It is a gram negative cocobacilli, non motile facultative anaerobe, oxidase positive, and named after Louis Pasteur who isolated the bacteria in 1880 from foul cholera infected birds. The type species is Pestorella maltosida. It causes zoonotic infections and sources of infection includes domestic animals and livestock. It's a serious pathogen for farmers because it infects young cows, rabbits, birds, causing upper respiratory disease. For example, pneumonia, bacteremia, osteomyelitis, endocarditis, and meningitis. It is normal flora, which is asymptomatic in respiratory tract of dogs and cats. Uh, cross infection to humans occurs through scratches, bites, and even nasal secretions. Easy to grow them on blood or chocolate agar. And treatment is with penicillin or cephalosporin. Now let's look at Pseudomonas, which gives an oxidative reaction in an OF test. Oxidase positive and is motile. The type species is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a free living bacteria often found in the environment and secrete water soluble pigments. 
It produces blue-green pigment, pyocyanin, and the fluorescent pigment, pyoveritin. It is also capable of synthesizing a large number of enzymes that allows it to metabolize even antiseptics. So, because it's of its uh, metabolic adaptability, it is often found in uh, industrial wastewater and also domestic wastewater treatments. It can grow up at 42 degrees Celsius and resistant to high concentrations of salts, dyes, weak antiseptics and common antibiotics. Because of this, it causes a lot of problems in hospital environments. So this is how it will look on a neutrinaga plate when you have Pseudomonas aeruginosa growing and secreting the greenish pyrocyanin so pigment. So it's an opportunistic pathogen and responsible for 10% of nosocomial or hospital acquired infections and also causes blood infection in weakened hosts. Causes a wide range of uh, infections and in immunosuppressed patients, mortality or fatality rate is very high, up to 50%. It's highly resistant to antibiotics because it has a very efficient efflux pump system which allows it to remove any antiseptics and antibiotic, antibiotics that entered its cell. So Pseudomonas infections are both invasive and toxigenic. So the infection follows three stages. As I mentioned, infection always follows attachment, then colonization, local invasion, and then disseminated systemic disease. So attachment is through fimbrae, exopolysaccharide, and surface-bound exoenzymes. The invasion is through extra extracellular proteases that break down physical barriers and damage host cells. And most important, exotoxin A, which blocks the translation in protein synthesis. So it also have elastase that cleaves collagen and also disrupts the immune system. That's how it can also defend itself against our immune system. It also have hemolysins to defend against neutrophils, lymphocytes and other eukaryotic cells. Even the pigment pyrocyanin has some virulence determinants where it can impair normal function of nasal cilia and disrupt the respiratory epithelium. It is a very highly versatile pathogen able to cause problems in various types of organs and systems. It grows well on laboratory media, non lactose fermenter. So on a McConkey Aga, it will be pale, colorless colony. Clinical samples usually yield smooth or mucoid colony, whereas natural isolates produce small and rough colony. Since it is resistant to many common antibiotics, susceptibility tests are necessary in order to find the right combination of antibiotics to treat this infection. In the order Pseudomonadalis, we also have the family Moraxellaceae and the genus Moraxella and Acinotobacter. These are also important pathogens. So for Moraxella, it is cocci, oxidase positive and often sometimes mistaken for nasaria. Okay. So they are parasites of the mucous membrane of humans and warm-blooded animals. Most are non-pathogenic and normal flora. However, they can sometimes cause eye infections and respiratory tract infections. Moraxella catarrhalis causes lower respiratory infection, chronic lung disease, and are common cause of otitis media, ear infection, sinusitis, and conjunctivitis in children. And many strains are now antibiotic resistant and produce beta lactamase. So we have under Moraxella C A, we have Moraxella and also Acinetobacter. So an Acinetobacter is also very important as cause of nosocomial infections and often have multiple resistance. Now we will look at the order Legionella lace 
and we will be looking at Legionella CA and Coxilla CA, especially Le Legionella pneumophila and Coxilla burnetti. So Legionella are difficult to stain by the gram negative anaerobic rods. So you, because they are difficult to stain, usually we look at them using direct immunofluorescence. Their natural habitat are damped biotypes, hot and cold water supply, cooling towers, for example. So there is a special medium and the use of 5% CO2 to grow them. So the use of 5% CO2 shows that they are capnophiles that prefers capnid environment with increased CO2. So these are examples of cooling towers that are used to cool buildings. But now, nowadays, uh, there is a tendency to use split air conditioning units. So then because uh, cooling towers have these damp biotypes, where the water is uh, contained here, it becomes a favorable environment for the growth of Legionella. So Legionella pneumophila is the type species and have 12 serogroups, where serogroup 1 is responsible for most of the Legionellosis in humans. So the infections occur when the droplets containing pathogens are inhaled. It was first discovered in 1976. Among those who attended a conference of American Legionnaires, which is a group of former professional soldiers. So what happened was the ventilation system in the hotel where the conference was held was contaminated with Legionella pneumophila and after the conference when the participants went back to their respective hometown they all came down with the same symptoms and illnesses. So an epidemiologist was able to look at their history and then connect them back all to the this conference. That's why it was named Legionella. So it's a facultative intracellular bacteria that can survive in phagocytes and macrophages. That's why it can overcome our immune system. And there are two clinical forms. One is Legionnaire's disease, a more serious form of the disease and Pontiac fever, a milder type. So for Legionnaire's disease, incubation period 2 to 10 days, multifocal symptoms including necrotizing pneumonia and more likely in patients with heart disease and immunocompromised patients with a high mortality rate above 20% and treatment with macrolide type antibiotics. For Pontiac fever, it is named after an epidemic in Pontiac, Michigan, and incubation period of one or two days is self-limiting and is considered a rare type of infection. And because uh, Legionella pneumophila is a facultative intracellular bacteria, in normal environment, they are actually found to be uh, intracellular with uh, algae and uh, also protozoa. Now we'll look at Coxiella brunetti under the order Legionella list, family Coxiella CA, and gives the oxidative reaction in the OF test. It's oxidase positive and motal. Coxiella brunetti was first discovered in the late 1930s in Australia and causes query fever or Q fever. Previously was placed under Rickettsia CA, now it is Coxiella CA. Disease occurs in two stages, an acute stage that occurs after two to three weeks of incubation and presents itself with headaches, chills and respiratory symptoms, interstitial pneumonia with progressive lung scarring, significant damage to the lung tissues, and then an insidious chronic stage, that is endocarditis that occurs years after primary infection with poor prognosis, that is, odds of recovery is low. 
So the primary reservoirs are cattle, sheep and goats and the inhalation of one, my, one organism usually yields disease in half the time. So this is an extremely low infectious dose, only 1 to 10 organisms required, making Coxiella burnetti one of the most infectious known organisms and it has potential as biological weapon. Coxiella can also undergo aerogenic transmission, that is, inhalation of contaminated dust. In the 1960s to 1970s, there is development of the first successful Q fever vaccine. Although Coxiella can be cultured, it should not be uh, cultured because it is too risky. There is also a group of gram-negative facultative anaerobic rods that are opportunists, frequently resistant to antibiotics and causes uh, nosocomial infections, including Capsiella, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Proteaceracea, Morganella, Providentia, and other genera. Another important one is the Cardiobacterium hominis, part of the Hayset group. So, the Hayset group of fastidious gram negative bacteria are the ones that cause infective endocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart due to bacterial infection. So HACET is an abbreviation of Haemophilus aggregatibacter, previously known as Actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Iconella, and Kingella. So this is the HACET group. We also have another acronym, the ESCAPE group. ESCAPE group is for the six bacterial pathogens that carry antimicrobial resistant genes. For example, uh, that is uh, Enterococcus physium, Staphylococcus aureus, Klebsiella pneumonia, Acinetobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Therobacter. So all these have uh, antimicrobial resistant genes, causes a lot of nosocomial infections, and have increased resistance to the antibiotics penicillin, vancomycin, and carbapenem. Please note that carbapenem is considered the last defense against resistant bacteria. So, HACET group, these are the ones, and you'll see that most of them causes endocarditis and are also uh, have antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm.